encounters improve the quality of our lives. Encounters come to reveal to us the futility of life without God. Encounters will activate purpose and calling in our life. Encounters come to restore intimacy and fellowship. The land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people which sat in darkness saw a great light, and to them which sat in the region and the shadow of death, light is sprung up. Encounters come to restore intimacy. Encounters come to reveal to us the futility of life. If you don't have a relationship with God, anything of value can become God to you. Welcome to Encounter Jesus Ministries, sustaining an experiential knowledge of God and walking in the fullness of our eternal ordination. Now, listen to God's servant, Apostle Oropo Michael, as he takes us through an encounter with the Word. Praise God. So we'll start a series this evening that will help us. I'm, I'm, I'm seriously interested in helping us grow in maturity and to come to that point where we are truly strong to represent God's agenda on the face of the earth. The apostolic church is not a church of a one-man star. The emphasis and the burdens of the apostolic church is to make everybody a witness of Christ. In the congregation that Jesus had, when Judas fell, they gave us the reason why he fell. Because it's impossible for you to enter that place and not catch fire, receive an encounter and grow. So the Bible told us he fell because he was the son of perdition. It was prophesied. That was why he fell. Now, when Judas fell and they needed somebody else to come into that office, they didn't need to start a special training program for leaders. What Jesus was teaching was potent enough to make everybody in the congregation a leader. And so they said, let's find any amongst us who went in and out from the baptism of John. So long as you are in that class, you are a leader. And they selected two persons by casting lots, and God picked one. And that one had the same stature as Peter. Because him too, Matthias was martyred. <laughs> Matthias was martyred. <laughs> he had the same stature. That was the church Jesus raised. And if we say we are apostolic or an apostolic generation, our goal must be to bring people to that point of capacity where anybody among us can represent Jesus. There was crisis in Jerusalem and the church scattered in the natural as it were. And the Bible says Philip entered Samaria. This Philip was an usher. That was all he did in that church. He wasn't even a prayer coordinator. And they told us why they needed them to serve food. So the ushering is not even the nature of ushering we do here. This one is to serve food. The kind of people you have in the kitchen during conferences. And he said because the church was spread abroad on account of persecution, Philip entered Samaria. And he said he preached Christ there and the whole city, Acts chapter 8 from verse 5 to 12, the whole city was full of joy. So much so that they requested Peter to come and confirm the body of Christ in that territory. You know it takes a lot to address a city. There must be an anointing and an authority in priesthood to be able to speak and the prince of the land will shift. There must be a grace on your life that we bring funds because the gospel through prosperity, the cities of God are spread abroad through prosperity. There must be so much grace on your life to attract the funds required to advance that kingdom. And apart from that, you are a stranger with a strange message that nobody has heard before because they were just starting the move and you enter the city. But the Bible said the lame were walking, demons were cast out and one man entered the city and the Bible said the whole city was full of joy. Now, would it not have been a shame if Philip did not address that city? If he didn't have the capacity. Because before Philip came, 
Darkness had already grown to a level where there was one sorcerer in that city that also bewitched the whole city. So before Philip came, the church of darkness had raised apostolic missionaries who had the stature of taking cities. Imagine if Philip came and all he could do was to affect a few people. It would have been a shame. But he came with a stature that was superior to that of the sorcerer. Because the sorcerer also bewitched the whole city. So if we don't raise men who can take cities, then there's something wrong with our discipleship. Because before mission, missions and missionaries began to move from the body, the devil already had city takers. And so the apostolic is to make everyone become a city set upon a hill that cannot be healed. But for that to happen, the texture of truth in its purity, in its power, must be communicated and men must be brought under the government of truth until they become that which they hear. And so we trust God to help us come into maturity. And so, I want to do a series called The Foundational Principles of the Doctrines of Christ. These things Paul called foundational. <laughs> Some people have never... <laughs> We are still growing in it. What Paul called foundational. Now let me read it to you. Hebrews chapter 6. From verse 1. Paul was so burdened. Because he came to a church. He was training them. And he needed to go to deeper issues. But once and again. He had this burden of coming back to show them the basic. And he said we can't continue in the basic. Now we want to do the basics. That is the basic we want to do now. That Paul said we shouldn't continue him. <laughs> he said, therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection. So as far as Paul was concerned, the heavier matters of the kingdom are matters that border on perfection. And perfection in this context is not just maturity. In fact, when you are dealing with the subject of perfection... The lowest on the cadre is maturity. But there are higher realms of perfection. You know it was the same Paul teaching in Ephesians chapter 4. And in verse 15 and 16, he said something that was strange. He said that we will grow into Christ in all measures. So Paul said it's possible for the believer to grow into him in all things. That means... In all things, it's possible to become exactly like Jesus. That you cannot be distinguished. So much so that when you are standing in the spirit, they need to introduce you so that they don't confuse you for Christ. And in order to show this, there were salient statements that Paul made in scripture that proved that it was so. And all the apostles operated like that. It was John that was speaking and said, as he is, so are we, not in heaven, in this world. Because they mirrored Christ in a way that they were exactly like him. As he is, so are we in this world. Paul was speaking in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 1. He said, be a followers of me as I'm follower of Christ. So if you follow me, even if you don't hear Jesus, you will arrive at Jesus' destination. I'm exactly like him. He said, concerning virgins, I have no commandment from the Lord. He said, but I'm a man who is trustworthy. So what I speak can be reckoned to as the oracles of God. And what Paul said, and he also affirmed that God didn't tell him, became scriptures. What level of perfection is that? What level of oneness is that? What level of alignment is that? That was the level that the apostles were looking forward to attaining. Their goal was not to have followers. Followership is a byproduct of light. When your light begins to shine, it says the Gentiles will come to you. It says kings will come to the brightness of your rising. Those were not the things they were pursuing. What they were pursuing was to become like Jesus. So when you see them, they are exactly like Christ. Paul was talking about the believer. And Paul said, what has Christ got to do with Belia? Because as far as Paul is concerned, a man who introduces himself as a believer must have the stature of Christ. And in Ephesians 4, 11... He said, the reason God gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers is for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, until we all come to the fullness of the measures of the stature of Christ. 
Paul believed that every believer should come into the fullness of the measure of the stature of Christ. So when you come to church, we are all like him. That's why he calls us the body of Christ. We are so one that if you were to distinguish us, it would be a function of parts. And he said, Jesus is head. The rest of us are body. We are that one with him. Because the, the, whole, the whole possibilities of God that was made available for and to Christ is made available to us. We have the faith of the Son of God. We have the peace of God. We have the word of God. We have the spirit of God. We have the grace of God. There's nothing we have that is actually ours. So God actually invaded our vessels to colonize us, to become exactly like him, so that we can mirror him. But you see, Paul said, before we begin to talk about these things, these issues of perfection, these issues of oneness, these issues of exactness like Christ, he said, let us consider certain foundational principles that we must master first. Because if you have not mastered these foundational principles, becoming like Christ will be theory. You will just be talking about it, but you will never know it. So he called them principles of the doctrines of Christ. When you are able to finalize on these principles, then you can begin the journey of becoming exactly like Jesus. And he outlined six things. Number one, he called it repentance. Hebrews chapter 6. Okay. Help us, help us, help us. He says, let us go on to perfection. Not laying again the foundations. He now began to list them. He called number one, repentance from dead works. Number two, he said, faith towards God. Number three, which is in verse two, he said, doctrine of baptisms. <laughs> and when we come here, I will show you why he called it baptisms. Because there are different kinds of baptisms. There are many baptisms captured in the theological register. Baptism into the body. Baptism by immersion. There are many types of baptism. But there are also many classes of baptism. There is a baptism in light. Which is a product of ascensions. The height you are submerged into light. Is what determines the glory of God that you can carry. So while we look at the baptisms, we will look at types and we also look at classes. It is in the realm of the classes of baptism that you will discover that some are baptized into the cloud. <laughs> These men are deep men. Who, some of the things they said here, the Holy Ghost allowed them like this so that only seekers will find them. Seekers. If your heart is after God, you will read these things and you will open up to God so that the Holy Ghost can come and imprint these witnesses into the tablets of your heart. But you see, most of us, our Christianity is still at the outer court. So we can't even talk about subjects that are sacred and hallowed. He said the thought is what? The doctrine of baptisms. And then he spoke about the laying on of hands. Then he spoke about the resurrection of the dead. And he spoke about, spoke about eternal judgment. Paul said, when you understand these six realities, then you will now, no matter what happens, your focus in life will now become transformation and transfiguration. You will just want to become like Christ. And when men see you, the only thing they can identify in you are the elements of the Christos that your life models. You will become like a theater that gives expression to the glories of Christ. You will no longer be known after the flesh. It's the essence of the Christ that your life will give expression to. When you speak, people will touch Jesus. When you show up, people will feel the presence of God. They will know that God is here. Even when you are not yet talking. Because the dimensions of Jesus will so clothe you that your generation will know that although Jesus has gone to heaven, but he has true representatives on the face of the earth. And that is the body of true apostolic Christianity. That men will become exactly like Jesus. So when you come to our churches, we don't have members. We have custodians. Custodians of different dimensions of God. Because they have been married to him, aligned to him, until they have become one with him. Because of our time, I will begin with the first. And then we'll touch some things and see how God helps us. I hope to finish this series Maybe in three Bible studies. But tonight, we are out of time. So I will just touch the doctrine of repentance from dead works. 
There are three major things there that we will look at. Number one is what repentance is. Number two is what dead works are. And then number three, how to engage this action of repenting from dead works. The spiritual structures that must be put in place if a man will truly repent from dead works. And so I'll be reading scriptures so that we can be helped. Now, the subject of repentance, many truly don't understand it. And so I will try to do a bit of um, word definition before I, I, I define what repentance is. In the Hebrew or the Old Testament, the word repentance has two root meanings. The first is the word nacham. And the word nacham is used 45 times in the Old Testament. And it simply means to feel sorry or to lament. So when a man is repenting of necessity, he will feel sorry. That is when you are wrong or you will lament when something is done and you 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 don't you wish it never happened so you lament over it that's what it means i don't want to start reading too many scriptures at this point because it will take us really really backward the second word is the word shub and the word shub simply means to turn back or to retreat now why am i giving you these root meanings because most of us have called and defined repentance by our own perceptions and so somebody is saying he's repenting from an issue or a sin and he has never turned back from it. He comes to God and weep, cry. And when he's done crying and biochemically he feels good, he goes back to it in two months' time. That thing you did was not repentance. Because repentance is either to lament over an issue or regret it and then to turn back from it. There must, this is why we teach this thing because there is a power that impacts the ability to repent. Repentance is not just something you feel like. It's beyond the realm of feeling. Feeling is involved, but it's deeper than it. Until you are able to retreat and turn back, you have not repented. So most of the things people call repentance, is not repentance. It's not. They are just responding to impulses. And the proof that they didn't repent is that that same thing, they will go back to it. Now, when God looks at such people, there's a definition for them in the spirit. They are called swines. You know what the swine does? When it comes out of the mud, you think he's tidied up, he will go back there. And that's how the dog operates. It vomits and it goes back to eat it up. So it's, 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 it's something that is considered an abomination in the realm of God. So what many people call repentance is actually acts of abomination. Because the things they vomited, they go back to eat it. So in the realm of the spirit, they are dogs. Not as an insult, but as an act that defines a spiritual operation and possibility. Now, to get more light, you check out the word also in the Greek. There are three words for repentance in the Greek. The first is metano. And metano simply means to think differently. You see that all of these words give us different perspective. One is so feeling sorry or lamenting. The order is retreating or turning back. The order is a mental process. You begin to think differently. So when a man repents, there must be a light that comes to him and makes him to begin to think in a different way. If you feel sorry over something and you even retreat, but you have not started thinking differently about that thing, you have not repented. I'm saying this so that when you, you need to repent over an issue, you will know it's something that requires great help. Great help. It takes great help for a man to be able to repent. A light has to come to you to think differently. You know what the Bible said concerning Jesus? It said, he hated iniquity. That's to think differently about sin. Somebody else is trying to hold himself back from sin, but there's somebody else who has come to a level where the mental faculty has been altered. He hates iniquity. There are things Jesus hates. He is love, but there are things he hates. One of it is iniquity. 
So there is a thinking process that Jesus has. And every repented believer must have it. It's called the mind of Christ. So the way Jesus thinks about something, you must come to that point where you begin to think about it. I know this may sound hard, but this is the standard of God. That's why the Bible says you should repent from dead works first. Because most of the things we do, we take glory for it. Because we don't know the standard of God. And that's why we speak in a very proud way most of the times. Because we do it by our own standard and we judge it to be God's standard. But it's not true. If you truly repent, you will know God helped you. And when you talk about it, you will talk about it with humility. Because if you know what repentance is and you are able to achieve it, you will know it was the help of God that took you there. The second word for repentance is to, it's called metamelomayo. And what it means is to act differently afterwards. It's also more like thinking differently, but this time around, action has been added. So, you are now thinking differently, but that thinking is not dead. That thinking is supported by an action. So, if 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 I found myself, maybe I lied to somebody and I, I, I now feel sorry about it, that's one. And then I, I, I desist from lying. That's two. And then I meditate. Maybe God, who convicted me, gave me a light. And I stop thinking lying is an advantage. That's three. Then number four, I take an action. And that action I take is to make it impossible for me to lie again. That's where you burn bridges. In the context of repentance, there's a necessity for burning bridges. If I'm fornicating with a lady, I won't just come and cry before God. Oh, oh, oh. When I now feel good, I stop. And then two weeks later, I see hi. I say hello. <laughs> you don't know what you are doing. When you repent, you will go and meet that lady and say, My dear sister, I will destroy your destiny. I will never talk to you again. And in case the one I said now didn't work, you will destroy my own. So don't talk to me again. <laughs> the first one is diplomacy. The second one is salvation. Because if you tell her we destroy your destiny, she'll say, no, we can work things out. <laughs> or maybe it's the lady. You know, usually it's ladies that are even stronger than men. In these sexual matters. The lady will come to the guy and say, please, I don't want to destroy your destiny. I see that you have a great destiny. So, uh, please, I want to avoid you. Not to... The guy will now say, no, don't worry. We, we, God will help us. <laughs> if he responds like that, tell him, uh, man of God, sir, you will destroy my own destiny. So, I will run. It's a flee from fornication. <laughs> when you do that, it's called metamelomayo. That's what you have done. You are running from the bed of corruption. Death is coming. So if you do the respectful one and it doesn't work, do the aggressive one. I will destroy your destiny. So please, I want to avoid you. If you continue, I'll say, Jezebel. <laughs> Jezebel, you are about to kill me. Jezebel, if he pays her, even if it's for ego's sake, let her leave you alone. When you burn that bridge, the next time demons come to you and start whispering. Showing you pictures. Even if you come to the river bank, there's no way to cross. You are burnt to the bridge. You see how it works? So all these hypocritical things we do here is a lie. They come and cry and cry. And then they will look for an apostle that is 10,000 miles away who don't know them. They will call you and say, Kai, I am masturbating. I fornicated yesterday. Why didn't you tell your pastor? If you feel a man of God should help you. Because you know if you tell your pastor, your pastor will stop you from praying, leading opening prayer. And you still want to be acting as man of God. So you can't say, where, say it where you will be helped. You want to say it so that an apostle somewhere, who doesn't know where you are will say, no, the Lord has forgiven you. It's where? It's a lie. If you want to do it, do it in a way that bridges must be burned. Because if you ask your pastor, your pastor will say, uh, who is the sister? Uh, <laughs> because both must be fished out so that they are helped and it doesn't happen again. 
We don't burn bridges and we say we are repenting. <laughs> and the final definition is metania. And that one means a body. A body. That's where the convictions of God comes in. When a man truly wants to repent, he will come under the weight of a body. This is not guilt that destroys. But this is a genuine burden because you have realized probably the love of God for you. And you have seen that it's unreasonable to do this. This kind of burden that God puts on your heart is what draws you to God to find help. Because when we fall, not when, sorry, if we fall, because we are not planning to. If we fall, we don't run from God, we run to God. Because if you run from God, who will help you? So this body is what will make you feel even more connected to the Lord. So you, you feel bad that you have hurt the one that loves you so much. In fact, it's from this body that weeping and sorrows come. Because you are not feeling... See the way the devil works it. There is a, 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 a worldly sorrow that is anchored on pride. Is it me like this that fell? My God. A global apostle, a global evangelist, the devil will now come and say, Kai, it's not easy, but it's well. You will die. He said, let him that stand it, be careful, lest he falls. There's nothing like, is it me like this? No. The reason we weep is because, oh, see the magnitude of love God has shown me. Jesus hung on the cross for me. My sins were forgiven. God showed me mercy. See how God has been kind to me. How will I be this unreasonable? So that burden is not born out of you having a lofty estimation of yourself. It's actually out of you having an accurate understanding of the price that was paid for your salvation. So because of Christ's affection towards you, you feel so unreasonable. And if that is your burden, you will now go back to God and fall before his face and say, Lord, help me. If you are able to achieve these five things, then you have understood what repentance is and your repentance will be genuine. The reason many don't genuinely repent is because they are not taught the complete protocol of repentance. Some were taught sorrow and regret and they stopped there. Others were taught to retreat and they stopped there. Because they are not taught the complete sequence they never come to receive the power to live above what threw them down. It begins with sorrow and regret for the action. Then you retreat. Then you sustain a change of thinking or mindset. Are you following this? Are you following? Then you begin to live differently afterwards or burning the bridge. Then you come to the Lord with a body for him to help you so that you don't go back again. By the time these five things are done, then the cycle of repentance is complete. Now, this is what God expects every genuine believer to go through if he falls. And Jesus said, if you fall seven times, you will rise seven times. So, those of you who make sin a practice, your whole lifetime may be used for repentance. That's why you cannot afford to take sin as a casual thing. If you need to follow this cycle for one offense, you know that sin can't be close to you. If not, you will spend your whole life repenting. And the whole investment of grace on your life will be spent on repenting. And you can't afford it. You see why these things are very important and it's needful for us to understand it. So repentance is regret over a wrongdoing that leads to retreating from that action and then sustaining a new thinking process that negates the reputation of that action and then living and taking actions consistent to that thinking process and finally responding to the burdens God put in your heart so that you can receive help from God. If this is not achieved, trust me, you will fall again. And the devil will make you a slave. And a point will come where guilt will overtake you. And you may, like Judas, destroy yourself. But that's not your portion. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Having said this, 
It's important to note, therefore, that repentance is not just a feeling of guilt. Many have a feeling of guilt and they stop there. That's not repentance. It's important to note that repentance is not just worldly sorrow. The Bible said in 2 Corinthians 7.10, it said, For godly sorrow worketh repentance. What is godly sorrow? A sorrow born out of your understanding and realization of the love of God. But he said, worldly sorrow worketh death. What is worldly sorrow? A sorrow born out of ego, pride, and things that do not pertain to Christ. If your sorrow is not because you have had a revelation of the gospel, you will end up in death. So repentance is not worldly sorrow. Repentance is not reformation. What does that mean? Packaging. What? That's not repentance. You did something wrong and then you say, somebody sins. He says it's a mistake. What, what does that mean? Somebody lies. He says, uh, what was the day you used now? It's packaging or it's coordination. And then you find people rebranding iniquity and living conveniently in it. Repentance is not packaging. If you sin, sir, you have sinned. And you must repent of it. Don't come and start telling us that uh, the righteous don't sin. It's a mistake. We are the righteousness of God. You don't know what you are talking about. You don't know what you are talking about. Because righteousness is not only a nature. It's also a lifestyle. First John chapter 3 verse 9 Verse 7, 9, and 10. The Bible says, little children, let no man deceive you. It says, him that is righteous, doeth righteousness. You cannot have the nature of a man and live like a baboon. The proof that you are a man is not just the nature, but that you live like every man. Imagine if somebody came here on his hand and leg, walking on, on four. What would you, you will know that this is, this is either a beast or something has gone wrong. You can't claim you are the righteousness of God and you are living like the devil. And so because you want to remain like that, we modify doctrine and we bring packaging into church. They say, ah, they made a mistake. What, what, is, what, what, what is that? It's not reformation. It's not packaging. And when you are going to God, go to God completely and submit to Him. Don't act as if all is well when nothing is well. And then repentance is not being religious. Some people, when they sin, the whole, the whole thing they haven't doing is because of the people. They want the people to know that they are spiritual men. This sin is a mistake. Oh. So you see them. They lie down. They are rolling down. There's no burden in their heart. There's no sorrow in their heart. There's no regret in their heart. And they are not... You'll find the brother... Ah, folly. He go on seven days fast. He tells everybody, because of that thing that happened, I'm on seven days fast now. I'm on seven days fast. And he's walking like this. And then, you now tell him, have you deleted the lady's number? Have you spoken to her? Have you broken the relationship? The man who is on seven days fast will say, um, ah. he does all the religious activity. Religion. And God looks at them and knows they are not serious. It's not religion. These actions are drastic. It must be followed. And then repentance is not a mental ascent. It's not just mere believism. It must be followed with action. That's why I told you, you retreat, you live according to the new mindset, and you come to God to receive help. Because there are many people... There must be action. If there's no action, it's just a mental activity. And it cannot help you. Praise God. Having understood what repentance is, in order not to leave you in limbo, you will not know how important this is, especially if God is helping you. There are many people who every day, they are thinking sin. They are living sin. And some sin. If God is helping you already, you feel you make mistakes once in a while or you sin once in a while, you may take these things for granted. But you see, if you don't repent for your sins, there are consequences. And that's why you must understand it and you must engage it consciously and deliberately. 
For repentance to happen, impute must come from God and impute must come from man. So there is a personal responsibility which is a human impute towards repentance and there is also a divine responsibility which he graciously carries out all the time. God is never tired to help us. And so in order for repentance to happen, there must be the divine impute and then there must be the human impute. There are four major things God does to a man who is on the journey of repentance. The first is the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Believe me, you cannot repent until the Holy Ghost convicts you. And those of you that at one point or the other the Lord helped you, you know what I'm talking about. You can still and know it's bad. In fact, you will be hoping and wishing that you felt bad for doing it. Have you not been there before? You lied to someone or you fornicated or you stole. And then even you, you are shocked that you are not feeling bad. You are, you are, you, you wished you felt bad. But unfortunately, you can't feel bad. You even knew down. You try to sing some sorrowful song. So that at least let tears come out of your eyes to show that you are feeling bad. But you can't. Because the conscience is seared with a hot iron. Everyone who genuinely repented, it was the Holy Ghost that convicted him. In John 16, 17 to 11, he said, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. Can you imagine what the comforter comes to do? One of the things the comforter comes to do is to afflict you with burdens. To afflict you with deep conviction that will make you weep so that you turn away from sin. He said, and when he is come, he will reprove the word of sin and of righteousness and of judgment of sin because they believe not on me, of righteousness because I go to the Father and ye see me no more, of judgment because the prince of this world is cast out. So the Holy Ghost begins by creating conviction first for those who have never received Christ. So when you preach on the crusade ground, the reason the people come to the Lord it's not because your message is intelligent too. You know, most times we even become proud by our preaching. You, you are bringing out some registers. And you feel it's the register that makes a fornicator who has been fornicating for 10 years to suddenly start weeping and submit his or her life to God. Or a criminal who goes to the highway every week to steal. You think it's your English language that made him change. You are arrogant. The Holy Ghost had to enter the heart of that man and tell him what you are not saying and amplify even the ones you are saying so much so that every cell in his body had the vibration. That's why they wept and came out because it's the job of the Holy Ghost to convict. But you see, he doesn't stop convicting at that point when you believe Christ. He will guide you into all truth. Jesus said in John 16, 13, he said when he comes, he will guide you. So many times when you take the wrong step and you go out of line, the Holy Ghost will tell you, this is evil. This is wrong. Come back. Isaiah said when you are in the wrong way, you will hear a voice behind you telling you that's not the way to go. So the way the Holy Ghost guides you is also to help you retract your step from evil. And all of that will happen because there is a way he pricks the heart of men. It's called conviction. When Peter preached in Acts chapter 2, the Bible said they were pricked in their heart. And they say, men and brethren, what shall we do? So, that's also the way he guides. He doesn't talk to your ear. He talks to the deep recess of your soul. He pricks you from there and you cannot deny it. And when that thing comes, you must retract your step and come back to the way that you should go. So, the first thing God does when he wants to activate repentance in the heart of a willing person is to trigger the conviction of the Holy Spirit. If you receive that conviction better respond to it quickly because that's the beginning of your salvation. Many persons are convicted by the Holy Ghost and they don't respond. Either because they are in the public or because they are busy at that time. They are hoping that later they will come back because they are thinking that they are being reasonable. Nobody is reasonable when it has to do with sin. The Bible says all we like sheep have gone astray. Every one of us choose the path of rebellion. 
The reason we come back to God and keep working with God is because that ancient spirit keeps pricking us from the deep tablets, depths of our hearts. The second thing God does to engender repentance is to open the light of the word of God. The light. There are many scriptures that may be dormant in your spirit until the day you err. Then you will now discover the powers that are locked in that scripture. The scriptures are the oracles of God. Most of them carry the dimensions of God. Some of them are potters into realities. And some of them carry tangible essence of God. And so it depends on what God unleashes on your soul. God can decide to open the scripture to you and it becomes a doorway into a a new level. And God can decide to also unleash a scripture and it becomes fire in your bones. The scripture is hammer. The scripture is fire. The scripture is door. It means many things. And one of the things God does when he begins to engender repentance is that the scripture either becomes fire or it becomes hammer. It will hit hard on you. So much so that you can't deny it. It will burn on your inside until you come under its government. That's what God does. In Matthew chapter 12 verse 41. He said the men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation. And shall condemn it. Because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. So when the word of God comes forth. One of the things it does is to engender repentance. There is that potency. Locked up within scripture. In Luke 24 verse 47. He said and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name. So when we are preaching the word of God, especially words like this, we are preaching repentance. Because the word of God has the capacity to communicate repentance. Acts 2, 37, 38, I mentioned it already. It said, now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren. So then the fornicators discover that we are all brethren. It's the speaking of the scripture that brought that level of reason. You know, before when they looked at them, they said, who are these drunkards? How can they be drunk in the morning? Who are these uh, charlatans? Until Peter started talking. As he was talking, fire was coming out of the world. It was bubbling out of the world and piercing them. When Peter finished talking, they discovered they had migrated. From calling them drunkards to calling them brethren. Brethren, what should we do in order to come into this your assembly? And Peter said, repent and be baptized in the name of the Son of God. So the word of God instructs and brings repentance. Every time a man repents genuinely, there's something he heard in his spirit. Scriptures came alive. After my mom died, you know, the first proper covering I have, in this life was my mother. Oh! She's a prayer woman. There was a way she contained me. I had many tendencies. But those powers gathered me to God. After she died, four months, six months later or so, or one year, I forgot it now, I I went my way. I said, Kai, if somebody is praying like this and dies, then I think we need to reassess this God properly before we... So I I will check God out next year. (laughs) <laughs> and I met some new friends and these brothers they, there's a way they chill you know this life is, is difficult so sometimes you need to chill <laughs> this was like 12, 13 years ago no 14, 13, 14 years ago they, they know how to chill so in the evening they will come and sit under a tree and they will be taking star lager beer star lager beer you mm. when you drink it then you, there is a heat that will come out of you. So you will come back to your real elements. After you take for a while, then you will become inspired. Stories that were many years ago will come alive. You will be excited about everything. There, there, there are different kinds of anointing. After I joined them, and I began to learn these ways, and I was having a good time. It's not only God you enjoy you. You will enjoy the world if you give yourself. But the problem is that that enjoyment leads to hell. He said, there's a way that cement right onto man. The end is dead. They now told me that this thing you are learning, there are deeper realms. They said on Fridays, there are some clubs in town. 
when you come to the club, you come around nine, and the whole place will be calm. The demons have not yet come. <laughs> the demons begin to come by eleven, when men are drunk, and then suddenly you see people start dancing, and then ladies will come on their own, guys will come on their own. When you dance together, you can go home. And here is a man that has an apostolic calling. I had a reason to be angry with God. You don't know how wise the devil is. You are the one who thought he was foolish. The devil came to me and said, look at you. You are going from VG to VG. You are traveling from place to place that you love God. Look at how, how did your mother now die? I got angry. And I found myself in club. And there is a skill. <laughs> You know, some of us, anything you do, you excel in it. That's one of the danger. There is key, there is key. And when we came to the club, I found the damsel that appeared to my soul. <laughs> ah! And at that point, I was high on alcohol. And when I carried the lady, did some dancing, and wanted to go home, I now heard from the wall. The wages of sin is dead. <laughs> that one is not Logos. It's Rema. Rema. You don't hear it in your head. You hear it in your heart. The wages of sin is dead. It looked as if I was in the middle of hellfire. I ran out of that place like a madman. That was where my deliverance came from. Because God wanted to quicken something. And I told my friends, bye bye. Now some of them are with me. All of us would have gone to Hades. <laughs> the wages of sin is dead. It began as if you are angry with God. You don't know where the devil is leading you to. Demons are whispering into your head to take you to the bottomless pit. The wages of sin is dead. The word of God came alive in my spirit. If you find a man who repented, go and ask him. He will tell you, I heard the word. Because the word of God, they are capsules of light. They are capsules of reality. The fire of God is encased in those tablets. You may find it as a verse, but when it comes alive, it's a reality. It will carry the full weight of the glory, the power, and the essence of God. You cannot genuinely repent until the word of God comes alive in your spirit. And it is the duty of God to keep managing the whole process until your heart is aligned to be able to pick the frequency of the word. And the Holy Ghost knows how to inject it. It will shoot it into your soul. And you that thought you were strong, you will break down like a child. And you will weep as though you are the weakest of all men. Is the word of God working a protocol of repentance into your spirit? The third thing that makes for repentance is the providential goodness of God. Because if God responds to us immediately, all of us will go to hell. The Bible said there's no righteous, not one. There's no one. I told you when I was teaching on Sunday. When we say complete process, complete process. Yes, you will complete it all. But part of the things that makes you complete it is mercy. Because if God withdraws mercy, nobody pass process. So even when we say you must pass process, you must pass process. We are telling you that God has a standard for his people. But that standard works as you are transformed day by day. And there are many things God will do. So what God does is that while he's transforming you, he's also showing you mercy. So this does not mean that people will not go through process. No, they will. They will complete it. And they will gain maturity. But what truly qualifies us is mercy. And so when God truly wants a man to repent, what God does is that he begins to show him his love. You can just be walking on the streets. And then you see something happens. Sometimes it's even a movie. And you see a scenario and that scenario will suddenly show you the evil in wickedness. And then you may see love showcased by somebody. And God will use it to interpret his benevolence to you. And you are watching a movie on your own. You are crying. Nobody knows why. There is something registering in your heart. The providence of God. And then sometimes you go through a circumstance. People died. People were helpless. But you went through it and you came out. And then you now ask yourself, how did you come out? It will now down on you that... Although you didn't qualify, but God is still watching over you. On your own, you'll be alone in your room and you start crying. You won't know why. It is the love of God that came alive. 
is the mercy of God that came alive. When God begins to show you his providence, it will also provoke repentance. That's why God does good sometimes. To help you understand that he's not your enemy. To help you understand that he is actually your helper. And until you accept that help, you have no destiny. He said in Romans chapter 2 verse 4, he said, do not despise the riches of his goodness. He said, or his forbearance, or his long suffering. He said, knowing that the goodness of God leaded unto repentance. We are all here because at one point or the other, we saw the goodness of God. At one point or the other, we saw the mercy of God. That's why we are here. We discover that out there is wickedness, but with Christ is everlasting mercy. His everlasting arm are wide open to show mercy to all men. In Second Peter 3, 9, he said, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness. He said, But is long suffering to us, Lord, not willing that any should perish, but that we should all come to repentance. So when God is showing mercy, it's not because God is weak. It's not because God cannot judge. He's a consuming fire. But the reason he gives us a long rope is so that at some point we will come to the realization of our evil and our wickedness and we will turn, turn to him. Finally, when God wants to impute his own dimension to engender repentance, there is what the Bible calls the chastening of the Lord. When the Holy Ghost pricks you, you don't respond. The word comes, you don't respond. The goodness of God is shown and you don't respond. Then God goes back to his koboko. <laughs> the chastening. You know, I was teaching them in Lagos and I quoted the scripture. I almost la busted into laughter. He said, suddenly a king that did not know Joseph rose. Israel was living in Goshen and having a good time. They were giving birth to children. They forgot their God. And life for them became about banquets, luxury and enjoyment. Until the Bible said a king that did not know Joseph arose. And that king came and said, Kai, if we leave these people here, they will become great, align with our enemies and destroy us. So they changed their menu. They brought Koboko and began to whip them. That was the first time we heard since they went to Egypt that they started praying. They were in Egypt for many years. There was no testimony of prayer until chastening came. So sometimes God will allow you. Since you say you are wise in your ways, Walk through life a bit. Let's see. And then you will now see forces that your brain is too elemental to deal with. Things will begin to arise in your camp like thorns and they will sting you like scorpion. When those chastening begins, then you will discover there is such a thing called altar. You will find out that there is a thing called altar. You will now find out how do they pray. That's when you will discover that you had a friend seven years ago who used to do the things of God. You will go and look for him. I say, ah, brother, where, where are you there now? He will say, I'm going to church. You say, who church? I, I won't come. No need for denomination. Anyone that is church, let me come there first. It's, it's Koboko that brings people there. And many times, God has a way of weeping people so that they can come into their destiny. The chastening of the Lord is not because God wants to be wicked towards you. It's because God wants to help you to fulfill destiny. It is still the love of God that motivates it. You know what the Bible said? In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 8 and 9, it says, But ye be, but ye be without chastisement, whereof I, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. It said, Furthermore, we have fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not rather be in subjection unto the Father of all spirits and live? So he's saying that. If you claim that you are sons, then you must endure chastening. Because if God sees anybody who wants to be a son, he will definitely chasten him. If he doesn't accept chastening, then he's a bastard. And so, they divide between rebellion and submission is chastening. If God doesn't chasten a generation, trust me, all of us will be bastards. And so, the way God brings us back under his government... Is either to allow certain things happen to us. Hope you read the book of Judges. Ha! Ah, you hear this one rose and he died. And Israel became godless. And then the, the Midianites will come. When the nations come and take them into captivity, after 40 years, they will now become reasonable. 
and say, when we were with God, we didn't suffer like this. Oh God, have mercy. And God will come. Well, I was waiting because uh, there is a language everybody hears. It's the language of Koboko. It's a foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. But the rod of correction. You know, don't allow your chastening to kill you. Because Paul became hard at some point and he said, some of the brethren that won't repent, he said, leave them to Satan. Let Satan buffet them. So that even if they lose their body, their souls will be saved. God is so mindful about your soul that he can allow you in some situation so that you genuinely repent in order for you not to miss heaven. I can tell you that most of the things men are going through and they are praying. If you like, let a prophet pour a drum of oil on your head. You will remain there, sir. What is happening is called Koboko. Go to the mountain and meet that apostle. Bring a seed. They will use that seed to advance God's kingdom, but you will remain there. Because if God delivers you from there, you will not fulfill destiny. He will lose you. So he will allow you until you repent. Didn't you see Israel? God saw them. They were dying in the wilderness. God was waiting. Until a whole generation is poured so that the heritage of God is not lost. You see people coming and say, I don't know why things are not working. There is a place called the belly of the whale. In order for you not to end in Tashish, but Nineveh. God will allow you in the whale. And through the whale, you will find Hades. It is from the belly of Hades that you will say, My God. My God. When you now submit, the whale will now look for Nineveh and vomit you. On your own, you will sit. And the door that was shut for 10 years, suddenly, it's not door that will open. It's gate that will open. And then you are wondering, what is going on? You have come to submission. Because God will insist that his purpose on your life is fulfilled. And his love won't let him. Because if he doesn't do it in time, then hellfire will help you. And he doesn't want you to learn it when there is no opportunity of repentance. So most of you who are going through things, calling prophets, calling apostles, sowing seeds, better make sure you are not living in rebellion. Because there are certain rebellions that will open the doorway for chastening. And if you don't discern that it's chastening and repent quickly, your wilderness journey will be far. come to perfection until you know these things. The chastening of the Lord. It will touch some things. It will touch it. The blessing will be on your life, but God will touch some things. Jacob was smart. He stole the blessing from his father as a swindler. And he was escaping with the blessing. I don't hammer. I don't hammer. Until an angel stood on the road. You can't pass that. This blessing a swindler can't carry it. A swindler can't carry it. And he wrestled with him from night to morning. And the guy will still not drop his carnality. And so he said, I know what to do. I will leave you with a body. And he touched his thigh bones. And from that day, the man was walking on his staff. He reduced his mobility. He reduced his capacity. And it was when he stood on the staff that he became a prince. He said, as a prince, thou hast power with God and has prevailed. At that point, he no longer depended on his sweetness. When he wanted to bless Israel, he was operating as a patriarch. He said, gather around me, you sons of Jacob, I will tell you the things that will befall you. And he began to talk their destinies. He wasn't prophesying, he was shaping them. Because as a prince, thou hast power. Imagine if God allowed him as a swindler, he would not have wielded that power. Hope you know that Manasseh and Ephraim were not part of the commonwealth of Israel. The guy looked at them and he put his hand on them. He said, the name of Israel is named upon you. He was the one that made them become the part of the 12 tribes of Israel. What stature is that? When the man speaks, it remains. Even heaven will honor it. He said, the scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the lawgiver from between his thighs, until Shiloh comes. Until Christ came, Judah is king. 
Those are the things God sees. When God is carrying you through the furnace, carrying you through the crucible of fire, it's because he is the one who wrote your ordination. He knows that a prince is about to become a charlatan. And so he will make sure that your steps are gathered towards him. Of the things you are going through is the revelation of the love of God. If you want to come out, submit. Repentance is a must. Then there's a human impute in the subject of repentance. And it's very important. The human impute is threefold. The first aspect is the intellectual aspect or the mental aspect. Your mind cannot be exonerated in the subject of repentance. Because you must come to a point where you reason your, your error. You must know that you are wrong. You must acknowledge it. If you don't acknowledge it, you can't repent. There are many people who are doing many things wrong. You will argue with them for one year before they even see that what they are doing is wrong. And so if a man can't see it or acknowledge it, the subject of repentance can't even come in the first place. So every man who must repent must understand what iniquity is. And he must acknowledge when he sins. In Psalm 51 verse 3, hear what David said. He said, for I acknowledge my transgressions and my sins are ever before me. He acknowledged it. It's a mental, intellectual aspect of the subject. There are too many people who are either too blind or too proud to see their faults. As you are talking to them, they don't care to know whether what they did was wrong. It has hurt their ego. And so they will carry their ego with them and not acknowledge the veracity of the communication. Such people can never repent. And so it will take a lot of humility for repentance to be possible. Because it's in humility that you can acknowledge your errors. Psalm 51 verse 7. He said, put me with his soul and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be as snow or whiter than snow. You have to acknowledge it. They are still using Bible to argue that this is not sin. This is not that. Whereas, even their conscience, as weak as it is, is pricking them. But they will never acknowledge it. That's why they are where they are. The second aspect is the emotional aspect. When a man repents, it impacts on his emotions. Job 42 verse 5 and 6. He said, I have heard thee with the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see thee. Wherefore, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. I abhor. The guy was in the state of so much conviction that the burden was so heavy on him that he almost hated himself for his sins. Some people claim they are, they are repenting, they are still proud and arrogant about it. No, that's not repentance. Don't waste your time with them. When a man repents, he shows through brokenness. He will weep, he will regret from it. You will see it visibly on him. And those signs are the things God is looking for. Many times, God is not so moved by what you are saying. He's checking your countenance to see the genuineness in your brokenness. Job said, I abhorred myself. Ezekiel 36, 31 and 32. He said, then shall you remember your own evil ways and your doings that were not good and shall loot yourself in your own sight for your iniquities and for your abomination. You will loot yourself. You will come to a point where you plunder yourself, you deal with yourself, you chastise yourself. Because you cannot imagine that you do this kind of evil, having seen the love of God. If your repentance does not affect your ego, affect you and break you, you may still go back to it because what you are doing is not genuine. It has not touched you. If it touches you, it will show. And then finally, there's the volitional aspect 
or the willful aspect. That's where the action comes in. When you acknowledge, when your emotions are hot, and you weep and you cry, then you must engage the will. And there are four things you must do with your will. Number one, you must turn away and forsake that sin. You must turn away from, or away from, from, or forsake that sin. If you don't turn away from that sin, you have not sinned. You have not repented. Matthew 12, 41. He said, then the men of Nineveh shall rise against you in judgment. Talking about this generation. He said, because they repented at the preaching of Noah. They repented. They turned away when they heard. And you read the story in the book of Jonah. What did they do? They wore ash clothes. They cried before the Lord. And they stopped the iniquity that they were involved in. Number two thing you do with your will is that you will turn to God in faith and surrender to the Lordship of Christ. There are many who turn from their sins, but they don't turn to the Lord. Have you seen people who feel bad about something before and they went to while away time with movies? Have you seen such people? You have an issue with your wife or you have an issue with your husband. You were wrong. The point was made clear and you just say, okay, you go out and drive around. Catch some fresh air. Come back later when the atmosphere is calm. <laughs> you have not repented. Or you go and watch a movie and you come back. No, that's not how it works. You turn away from that sin. And then you turn to the Lord and repent. And if you repent before God, in most cases, you will have to make peace with that person. As a sign that what you told God is genuine. And I'll talk about that last. Number three, what you do is you confess your sins. Why do you confess your sins? God does not forgive you because you confess. Because they were confessing for over 1,500 years before Jesus came. Nobody's sin was forgiven. God forgave all of us because of the blood of Jesus and our faith in the finished works of Christ. But confession is important because of your conscience. Because if you allow it and your conscience become hardened, your conscience will shipwreck your faith. He said, holding faith and a good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith, have shipwrecked their faith. And I've taught you this subject already, so I'm not going over it. If you look at the book of First John, chapter 1, verse 9, hear what the Bible said. First John 1, 9, hear what the Bible said. He said, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins, and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But confession doesn't stop here. Sins are not, forgiveness of sins does not stop here. Go to 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. See what the Bible said. Quickly, quickly, quickly. It said, My little children, these things are right unto you that you sin not. It said, If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Go to verse 2. It said, He is the propitiation for our sins. And not for our sins only, but the sins of the whole world. So, Jesus is playing two roles here. Number one, his propitiation for our sins and the sins of the whole world. And number two, for those of us who are in Christ, he's our advocate. So, Jesus is acting like the high priest that enters the Holy of Holies with the blood and confesses. You see that? So, even if you don't confess, Jesus' confession to God can affect your sins. And I can tell you, there are two kinds of operations of sin. There is sin by commission, there is sin by omission. Even the confession you are carrying out is the sins of commission you can confess. There are many sins you are sinning now that you don't even know. And I can assure you that there are many sins that even when you are about to die, unless God tells you that this thing is sin, you will not know. The Bible says whatever is not of faith is sin. So if you are about to die and you are afraid of death, you have sinned. So there are many sins of omission. That's why, in addition to your confession, Jesus is your advocate. And in case you think, okay, uh, that thing he's saying is different, go to verse 12. First John 2 verse 12. The Bible said, I write unto you, children, help me first. I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you, not because you confessed. Not because Jesus confessed. Your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. Because now God has included you in himself. So God forgives you because you are in Christ. 
this is where justification comes in. The day you accepted Christ, you were not only forgiven, but you were justified. Justification is the last thing you do in a law court. Where a man is declared free and acquitted. So that case is closed. Are you seeing that now? So why do we confess? We confess because if we don't, our conscience will be wrecked. It shows that we are reasonable. You can't hurt somebody or hurt God and then you act as if all is well. No. If you have a conscience, you can't do that. You will go back to God and acknowledge your sins. Look at the story of the prodigal son. When he returned to his father, his father didn't forgive him because he confessed. While he was coming from a distance, the father ran to him, hugged him, kissed him, gave him his sander, put his ring on him and brought him back. He reinstated him before the boy started rehearsing what he planned. Father, I'm not worthy to be called your son. I'm a servant. Come inside and, and enjoy yourself. You think this talk you are talking is what will save you? What made me forgive you was Jesus hanging on the cross. He took death for you to be forgiven. It's not English. Don't come here with a speech. Your speech can't bring forgiveness to you. It's death. He said the wages of sin is death. If Jesus does not die, nobody will be forgiven. But confession is necessary because... If you don't, it means you are not reasonable. And it means your conscience is dead. And if your conscience is dead, at, after a while, your faith will also die. It's a holding faith and a good conscience, which some, having put away concerning faith, have she pregged their faith. So what I'm teaching here is not forgiveness, it's repentance. And what did the Bible teach us? If a man truly repents, he should confess. He should confess as a sign that he has acknowledged his sins, as a sign that he's reasonable, and as a sign that he truly, truly, truly repents from that iniquity. And finally, what does confession, what does repentance constitute? Under application of your will is restitution. But restitution guided with wisdom. If I steal your phone, I won't go to God and cry and say, Lord, I am sorry. Sir, God has forgiven you, but return my phone. I need it. <laughs> I need my phone. Don't steal my phone and go to God and cry and cry and say, Lord, I will never steal again. Thank God you will never steal again. Sir, bring my phone back. I need it. Are you following? <laughs> so, if what you took can be restored, restore it. Restitution is the proof that you are a genuine person. But I said restitution must be guided with what? Wisdom. Somebody brought a case the other time. And he said, there is a woman. A woman was promiscuous. And went and had an affair with a young man. And then she came for a meeting and encountered God. After encountering God, she genuinely repented. And she met a young preacher. And the young preacher said, you must bring that man to your husband Can you say you are genuine? You want them to accuse that man of murder? You, do you want this innocent man after suffering from his wife's promiscuity to now become a victim of murder? Which one do, which one, what do you mean by bring this man? Go and meet your husband. Confess your sins and make peace and live a good life. Why are you bringing this man? Do you want this man to be guilty of bitterness and hatred? Any day he sees this brother, he will now want to kill him. And then any time he's weak, the devil will come and say, that brother, the way he's looking at you, he's acting as if, what do you mean? Even your wife. And then the man will go and kill him. And Restitution requires what? Wisdom. That's why the mature are the ones who guide restitution. Are you following? But if it is possible, exact your will to carry out restitution. Sometimes restitution is simple. Just come and apologize to the person. I'm sorry. I did this. I did this. I acknowledge my fault. Please forgive me. That's restitution. The other person said somebody um, I, I can't balance this one. Let me leave it. There are some radicals. So repent. <laughs> if I say that one now ah, ah is a body no. Let me leave it. You have understood my teaching. So we stop there. Hallelujah.
So that's repentance. Now, what is what is dead works? I have five more minutes. Let me round up quickly. When you are studying the Bible, you will meet different kinds of works. Broadly speaking, there are works of of the law and there are works or workings of grace. That means dispensationally speaking. Are you following? So when the Bible is talking about works, it's important to explain a few things. If you study Galatians chapter 3 from verse 1, Paul was speaking. Oh foolish Galatians, he said, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus has been evidently set forth, crucified amongst you. Go further. He said, this only would I learn of you. Receive ye the spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. So there's such a thing called the works of the law. The works of the law is man trying to keep God's standard by God's, by his own ability so that he will be accepted in God. That's what they were trying to do in the Old Testament. You have seen God's standard. You want to use your own ability to keep God's standard so that God can accept you. But you see, they tried for 1,500 years. Nobody was able. That's why the Bible said, there is none righteous, not one. Everyone tried. Nobody could keep God's law. Or could do God's, keep God's standard or walk to be accepted. And that's why all of us are accepted in Christ Jesus. You didn't do anything to be saved. You didn't do anything to be accepted in the beloved. Christ was the one that did every work for your acceptance. I'm trying to paraphrase a lot of things to keep it simple because I'm out of time. If I had time, I would have taught some intricate part. But that's the first dimension of law you collide with. And there are many people who are in God now who are still trying to do things to be accepted by God. They are trying to do things for God to look at those things and accept them. Paul said, anything you do in order to be accepted is an attempt to undermine the finished works of Christ because you are already accepted because of Jesus. Are you following that? So there are many people today who think when they fast more, God will love them more. God can't love you more than he loves you already. It's a lack of understanding. The Bible said, when we became part of the family of God, in Ephesians 3 from verse 15 to 19, it said the full depth, height, breadth, and worth of the love of God was accomplished. It says it's our duty now to understand it. And Paul was praying for the church, for their eyes to open to see it. That as touching love, God has completed the equation. God can't love you more again. All the love of God he has given to you in Christ Jesus. It will be impossible for God to love you more. So if you are fasting and praying for God to love you more, you will lack understanding of the gospel. We already have the full love of Christ. Our job now is to know it and to walk in it. Are you seeing that? So anybody who tries to do anything to be accepted in God is operating by the economy of the law. But you see, if you think because you are not working to be accepted in God, and so you will become idle, you are finished. Because the idea is not to remove works. The idea is to redefine works. Because there is now another kind of works. It's called the works of faith. The Bible said in James chapter 2 verse 19, 20 and 26, it said concerning the man, it said thou believest, talking about your faith now, that there is only one God. He said, thou doest where? He said, the devil also believes and trembles. And he goes to verse 20. This is what he said. He said, but will thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead. So if you don't walk by grace, your faith is dead. In verse 26, he said, as the body without the spirit is dead, he said, so also faith without works is dead. So when you come into Christ, you don't stop walking. You keep walking, but now you walk by grace. You have received God's ability and you are putting it to work. So you are no longer walking to be accepted. You are walking because you are accepted. 
Somebody can come to this ministry now and say, please, I want to join the usher so that apostle will know me. So that apostle will become my friend. So that apostle can become close to me. That's law. But those of you who are here, are you not working? So you are not working for apostle to know you. You are not working to be close to apostle. You are actually working now because apostle knows you and accepts you. Are you seeing, are you seeing the difference? And so when you are working now, under grace, it doesn't make God love you more. But it makes God entrust more to your hand. Because God sees that you are responsible. So if God is seeing two Christians, one is not praying, another one is praying. God will prefer to send the one praying because that one has capacity to represent him. It's not because he doesn't love the one who is not praying, but the one who is not praying cannot handle kingdom. So this is where many miss it. They say, no, we are accepted in Christ, so we will not walk. If you will not walk, God can't entrust anything to your hands because you can't do kingdom. So even though God loves all of you equally, it is the one who is demonstrating capacity by walking that God will commit kingdom to because kingdom must be advanced. So, grace does not stop you from praying. Grace does not stop you from fasting. Grace does not stop you from laboring in the kingdom. But now you labor by grace. In 1 Corinthians 15 verse 10, Paul was given an analogy. And he said, he labors more than they all. He said, yet not I, but the grace of God that is in me. So, any day I don't fast, any day I don't pray, I won't feel bad as if God doesn't love me anymore. Any day I don't pray, I will feel as if, Kai, my gate is empty. I have a walk that I'm walking with my father. I need to go there and play my part. So it is responsibility that pushes me not to, 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 to manipulate God with my walk. Are you seeing the difference? So there is a walk here. This walk is powered and sponsored by grace. Now, under this economy, then there are, other, there are two kinds of work. There is the fruitless work of darkness. And then there is also the fruitful work of grace. Or the acceptable work of grace. I show you two scriptures quickly as I begin to round up. Hmm. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 11 and 13. Because when you come into faith, you will discover... That there are different kinds of works. There is a work that is fruitless. That God does not recognize. And there is another work that God accepts. He said, and have no fellowship. He is talking to believers now. With the unfruitful works of darkness. But rather reprove them. And in verse 13. That's my emphasis. He said, all things are reproved and made manifest by the light. No, go to verse 12. Go to verse 12. It says, For it is a shame even to speak of those things which is done in secret. And he now said, Light manifests all things. So what this scripture reveals to us is a kind of work that in the realm of God is fruitless. Those are the works we call dead works. That's what Paul is teaching us to repent from. When he talks about repenting from dead works, he is talking about the fruitless work that even the devil takes advantage of. But there is a work that is acceptable. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 28. He says, having received a kingdom that cannot be moved, let us receive grace to serve God acceptably. What distinguishes the fruitless work of darkness from the fruitful work of grace? It is who takes the glory. A man who is functioning by dead works is not powered by God. He is powered by his human abilities. His ego his pride, his competitiveness, his ambitions. And because if he achieves anything, he can take glory for it. God cancels it. So Paul is teaching us that we should turn away from anything that does not give praise, honor, and glory to God because we can claim and take glory for it. Rather, when we walk we should walk because we are sponsored by grace. So the concept of dead works is actually doing things in the kingdom that is not inspired, that is not powered, and that is not motivated by God. If you find yourself doing, and these things can be very spiritual. This is where many people miss it. Now, what Paul was dealing with here is not sin. 
Paul is considering that the people operating here have gone beyond the level of sin. Because he's not talking about the works of the flesh. That's sin. Paul is talking to people who are now believers, who want to grow in God. But he said there is an evil, there is an iniquity that the devil can put in their soul. That instead of doing spiritual things by the energy of God to glorify God, they are doing it from their own energy to glorify themselves. He said anything you do by your own energy to glorify yourself is a fruitless work. And it's called dead works because God will not recognize it. Have you seen people praying? And the whole idea of prayer is to prove that they have capacity to pray. Many times, check, they are not focusing on God. They are trying to prove a point. That's dead works. Grace doesn't sponsor that. Have you seen people preaching? And the whole idea, as spiritual as it is, the whole idea of preaching is to prove to one professor or to prove to one businessman that whatever you think you know, I know better. And all the grammar that he's speaking is not about glorifying Jesus. It's not about transforming the person. It's so as to prove a point to that person that I am more intelligent. It's dead works. It will never produce result in the realm of God. And if you want to verify it, come after 10 years, the people will remain the way they are. Because the power of a message or the power of an activity that is done in the house of God is not in the excellency in his presentation. It's in the extent to which he glorifies Christ and the degree to which he transforms men. So if I say I am preaching prosperity and you come back here after five years and these people you are seeing here, their life is not changing. I wasted their time. It's dead works. Because if grace is in it, it's not in the intelligence of the preaching. It's in the power to change their story. If I say I am preaching on healing here and people are here dying and God is not putting his hand to heal them is dead works and so Paul is saying the first thing you must know if you want to grow into perfection is to understand that in this equation only Jesus takes the glory God can share his glory with us so that we represent him but when we are done anything we do only God takes the praise if anything happens that makes you take the praise is dead works. And so people exert their will. People try everything possible to be seen is dead works. When grace is sponsoring it, only Jesus will be glorified and men will be transformed. He said the first thing about the doctrine of Christ is repentance from dead works. I can assure you, most of the things we are doing in church today is dead works. From prayer to preaching, to all our activities. Today, when people organize an event, it's just to make a statement that they too have been helped of God. And the whole idea is to show that they have been helped. From birthday parties to Thanksgiving service, somebody is coming to thank God, but you know that he's just trying to make a statement. It's dead works. God will not acknowledge it and there will be no reward for it. And so if you truly are interested in God, you better read yourself from that desire to prove a point. From that desire to show that you have arrived. From that desire. Because every time it becomes about you, grace is withdrawn. You will notice that it's your weed that is sponsoring it. You can come to certain places. Somebody is praying for 15 hours. He is just trying to complete that time so that his friends will know that he has hit a new threshold. Today, when people are praying, if camera is not around, prayer is, is weak. Bring camera and connect to internet. You will see prayer that will bring down the roof. Ka, 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 ko, 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 ke, ke, ke. Because camera is showing. Even those who were not praying, when they put camera. Somebody is praying at the back. He is just talking casually. Tell him, come and lead the prayer for five minutes. The lion in him will wake up. Because it's when he's carrying Mike that he's praying to God. When he was walking there, he's not praying. It's showmanship. And you know what Jesus said? In Philippians chapter 2 from verse 1. He said, let this mind be in you. I think that's in verse 5. In verse 2 and 3, he spoke about fellowship and that nothing should be done for vain glory. If it is vain glory, it is dead works. Can I shock you? Even alms giving. Today is largely dead works. 
people want to give arms, they either mutilate, condemn, and undermine the people they are giving to in order to appear to the world as philanthropists. And God looks at it and says, there's no reward for this one. Because this is done to satisfy ego. This is done to prove a point. This is done to make a statement. My glory is not in it. I didn't take the glory. You took the glory. Anything that does not ascribe glory to Christ is not sponsored by grace and it is dead works. Quickly, how do you kill dead works from your life? Number one, know the will of God on every subject. Know the will of God. If you want to pray, know the will of God concerning prayer. So that you don't pray your emotion or pray your ego. You will pray the will of God. You know, Paul was teaching in Ephesians 1, 17 to 19 and Colossians 1, 9 to 11. He spoke about coming into perfect understanding of the will of God so that you can be well pleasing to God. Many don't know the will of God. That's why they are doing it their own way. If you know how God recommends it, you will begin to pattern your life to do it that way. Know the will of God. If you don't know the will of God for a long time, you will do dead works. Number two, how do you come out of dead works? Be spiritually minded. Anything you want to do, be conscious of grace. If you become conscious of grace, you will look away from yourself. You can't look at yourself and focus on Christ at the same time. He said, look away unto Christ. The moment a man begins to look at grace, grace will humble him. Because he will know that if God will endorse it, then it has to be God's way. The reason many times we don't function or do the works of grace is because we are not grace minded you find that in Romans chapter 8 from verse 1 to 5 in fact in verse 5 and 6 it said to be carnally minded is death it said to be spiritually minded is life and peace Colossians 3 from verse 1 to 3 it said if you say you are dead with Christ let your affection be on the things that are above where Christ is so if you begin to focus on God focus on grace you will discover that gradually you will migrate from yourself and unto God. And you will start doing things only to please God so that grace can continue to grow in you. Number three, how do you live above dead works? Be mindful of eternity. Anything you are doing here, be sure that at the end of time, what gives it value is the quality of reward you receive. The reason many people do things to show off is because they are not mindful of eternity. If I know that this preaching I'm preaching, there is a reward for it in eternity. My focus will be to preach so that I'm rewarded. If I'm giving alms to somebody and I know that these alms I'm giving, there is a reward for it in eternity. I will look away from the applause of men, from the recommendation of men, and I will focus on eternity. So I will do it the God way. In 1 Corinthians 4 verse 5, he said, judge nothing before it's time. He said, wait until the end when God will give praise to all men by revealing the counsels of their hearts. Be mindful. Be mindful. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 1 to 2. It said, being encompassed by this cloud of witness, let us run the race with patience, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. If you are not thinking about the end, you can afford to live here for yourself. Number four, how do you deal with this thing called dead works? Subject your mind to healing. To healing. Many persons are doing what they are doing because their minds are grossly injured. Some by ignorance, they don't know. So what they need is knowledge. But others is injury of the mind. There are two things that happen to people. When you find somebody who was hot, hot when growing up, you will notice that bitterness will be in his mind. And so every time he's talking, he will be aggressive. He will attack people. He will try to undermine people. Because when he was growing, he was hot. He was oppressed. And so he put an injury on his soul. If you don't go to Christ and tell him to heal your mind, you will do many things in order to boost your ego. Because when you were growing up, you were oppressed. So now you want to show everybody that you are somebody. That injury of the soul will make you do many things, not to glorify God, but yourself. Some is insecurity that enters their minds. Because when they were growing up, things were taken from them. So now they are not sure of anything. Now that God has given them an opportunity to serve, everything they are doing is in order to get something. Because there is still that injury in the soul that everything they have can be taken. 
And so now that God has empowered them, they want to build everything around themselves. So you find insecurity, you find bitterness, you find ego full in the minds of men. And so everything they are doing, although spiritual, is about self. And they don't mind if others are destroyed. It's an injury of the soul. If that injury is not healed, they will continue like that. And at the end of time, all their works will be dead works. You need to come to God and tell him to heal your mind. Meditate on scriptures consciously and ask the Holy Ghost to help you. Sometimes it can even be a mental glitch. You had pride and God is dealing with it. But there is a little residue there. So you are just talking and then for two seconds there is a glitch. You switch into that pride frequency and switch back. The Holy Ghost will always tell you. I was preaching the other time in a way. I think I was trying to encourage the people that we are excellent, we have eternal life, so we are flawless, we can't make mistakes, we can't fail. And I said some things. And somebody sent me a clip. He was so blessed. Trying to tell me, Kai, when he heard this clip, he was so blessed. And when I played it, I heard myself say, I've never failed before, I'm an intelligent person. And I started asking, I said, am I the one that is saying this thing? My wife heard it and said, hmm. That whom is a, is a two years sermon. <laughs> am I the one saying, it's a glitch. There is pride. God is dealing with that pride. But sometimes, as you are just at that ascended level, you glitch back. And then you touch something and come back. If you don't go to the Holy Spirit in repentance and say, help me, help me, you will see that the frequency of that glitch will be increasing and it will corrupt everything you have done. I wish I didn't go for that meeting. It shocked me that I could speak with so much pride about myself. Me that thinks that I don't care about anything, everything in me is God. I didn't know that I was blind because there was a glitch and the Holy Ghost was quick to draw my attention. For many people, it's insecurity. For many people is bitterness. Bitterness. They were so hot when they were growing up. So once and again, bitterness keep cropping up. They will take action. As they go back, the Holy Ghost will draw their attention. If you don't deal with this matter, it will rob you of your inheritance. And so the fourth way to deal with dead works is to submit your mind for healing. That's why Paul said, be not conformed to this world. He said, be it transformed. By the renewing of your mind. If there's any area you notice a weakness, you don't need a preacher. Go and gather scriptures. Eat it on that matter. Meditate on it. And as you are meditating, be asking God to help you until the scripture reprograms you. In Psalm 119, verse 9 and 11, he said, How shall a young man keep his ways? He said, By taking heed unto thy word. He said, Thy word have I put in my heart that I should not sin against you. If the word enters, the word can reprogram you, it will change you until you become like the Christ. The first principle of the doctrine of Christ is repentance from dead works. Never waste your existence by doing things that will not attract reward. Never waste your existence by doing things that will not glorify God. Never waste your existence by doing things that will not bless others. If it is always about you, it will be dead works. You know why? Because the grace of God in most cases will not sponsor it. And if it is not by grace, it's a testimony that is not glorifying God. And it is not accepted. He said, having received the kingdom that cannot be moved, let us receive grace whereby we serve God acceptably for our God is a consuming fire. Bow your heads and pray. Tell the Lord to help you tonight. Help me now. Where's my sister?
brings a message like this is because he wants to trigger recovery and restoration. Is it possible that you have been working for God for 10 years and there's no reward ascribed to you? Because it's either not powered by grace or it's not glorifying God. Is it possible that that huge sacrifice you carried out, you gave out your car, you gave out your house, but it's never about God and there's no reward for it. Although that sacrifice cost you two years of struggling, but there was no reward for it. The Bible said if we will repent, if we will confess, it said it's faithful and just. This next one minute, ask God to help you. Ask God to help you. Every one of us must do this act check. He said, judge yourself that you may not be judged. Jesus, I am your, I am your own. Oh, your own. On ground, online. This is a call for repentance. I am your own. I am your own. Till the day you will come. Jesus, I am your own. It's alright. Thank you, Father. There are many things God wants to do with us, but sometimes we are too full of ourselves. If we will genuinely humble ourselves before him, there is no limit to what he can do with us. Every one of us, once and again, we need to come to the altar, hold on to the horns of the altar, and say, Lord, have mercy. I want to pray for you now, as I pray for myself as well, that God will help us. The devil is a master manipulator. He will let you know if you don't do it like that, they won't respect you. They won't honor you. He can even use two, three scriptures to convince you. A man in honor that knoweth not is like the beast of the field that perishes. And he manipulates you with scripture. It's God that places honor on you. Don't force it. Serve God. He will put honor on your life. Don't let the devil manipulate you. So that you don't appear in eternity and discover there's no arrangement for you. Because you robbed yourself of everything in time. And most of these things are caused by soulish injuries. Most of them. The prayer I want to pray tonight is for God to heal our souls. Healing. Healing. Some of us, these things happened to us when we were five years old. Five years. They brought somebody to the house that is always knocking you and oppressing you. So fear entered your heart. Because of that fear, you are always trying to do things to your advantage. And they become dead works. Some of you, you had a deformity while you were growing up. People laughed and mocked you because of that bitterness entered your soul. Insecurity. And you are now doing things to prove a point. If Jesus doesn't travel deep to reprogram that soul, you may be highly anointed, shaking the world, but there is iniquity, there is injury in your heart because of the bitterness that grew with you and now it has formed your personality some of us we were robbed of what belongs to us or we were forced to always compete to have things now we are serving God and God says surrender but it's still competition a moment you see a brother do something you too must do it it's not about glorifying Jesus this guy came here he did this thing and this thing happened me too I must do it He's not greater than me. All of us are businessmen. All of us are prophets. All of us are evangelists. Whereas the guy who went there, God sent him there. And because it was God, he showed the honor, the glory showed. This one you are doing is works of the flesh. Everything you do can be spiritual. But God is not there. Till the day you return. Thank you, Father. Lord, tonight we surrender to you. Hmm. My God. We surrender to you. 
God is telling you, the money coming to the ministry now, put it in evangelism. But you say, no, that young prophet has early this screen. Is it better than me? Me too, I must. And then you wreck your ministry. Dead works. Because of insecurity. Ask him to help you. These things can be so deep. Only the Holy Ghost will travel that deep to show you. God is telling you, do something else. But you are compelled to do another. Because somebody around you is doing. You don't need those pressures. It is injuring your soul. If you ask him genuinely to heal you tonight, he will touch you. He will touch you. Thank you, Father. And so, Lord, we surrender tonight. We ask that you wash us with his soul. We ask that you purge us with fire. We ask that you transform us by the light of your countenance. Let every deficiency and injury of the soul be removed. Heal us, O Lord, and cause us to walk by grace. Let our services be acceptable before your sight. That we may have rewards even at the end of time as your name is glorified. You say unto him that answered prayers shall all flesh gather. Help us tonight, Father, that our prayers may ascend as incense and look upon them with graciousness and let there be transformations, let there be healings, let there be illumination such as brings us to that point where we align with your perfect will. So let it be written. So let it be established. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Thank you, Father. The Lord bless you. As you go home, the Holy Ghost may give you some specific prescriptions. Deploy yourself to it. Let him help you. So that your walk with God will not be considered a garbage. Because I see these things every day, both in me and in those around me. Sometimes you come to preach, and because the first person who started preaching, the moment he started talking, people started falling down. You see the next minister under pressure. Power must move today. Meanwhile, God is saying, tell them to love me. And they will force it. People must fall down. Or somebody came to lead prayer. And the place exploded. They say, oh, mercy, your voice is thunder. The next person comes. And what God is saying is, people should just love him. You see somebody whose voice is like a cricket. Because somebody has shouted like thunder. Him too will come. Hey, Aka, hey, Aka, hey, Aka. Oh, God, will you die? Relax, sir. It's not shout, God heard. It's not called shouting in tongues. It's called speaking in tongues. Don't kill yourself. It's God we are praying to, not the congregation. <laughs> Go home with these bodies. Let God help you. If you were blessed by this message you just listened to, and you wish to make Jesus your Lord and personal Savior, kindly repeat the prayer after me. Dear Heavenly Father, I believe in your Son, Jesus Christ, and that he died for my sins and was raised from the dead for my justification. I therefore confess with my mouth that Jesus is the Lord of my life. I receive eternal life into my spirit. I am born again. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. If you just said this prayers, please send us an email at info at encounterjesusministry.org or info.egmi.ng at gmail.com. You can also visit our website at www.encounterjesusministry.org.